All right, here we are. We're talking about The Clash at the LA Coliseum this weekend. First and foremost, live show, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, the first official live show on this channel. That'll be uh, Sunday morning. You can join me and just uh, join me with uh, everything that I've always done the past couple of years. Secondly, uh, premium live show on Saturday night, probably following the heat races and everything as I just build projections and answer whatever questions you want. If you want to look at data, whatever. Ask you. Look, that's a premium show. Ask me whatever dumb question you want. I am happy to answer anything there. Um, when we're looking at the LA Clash this weekend, I've already made a video breaking down the last two races or things that I want to focus on. So if you feel like I don't talk about a certain aspect or whatever, it's probably mentioned in the previous video. I don't necessarily like repeating things. I don't really like wasting my time with going over things that people already know or already should know or be aware of. Like, I'm not going to be here and be like, well, if you look at the Richmond data from last year, so-and-so is probably going to perform well. I Like, we're not wasting time with that. <clears throat> this is how my brain works. We need to analyze the different aspects of the... Um, nature of this event, the nature of it towards DFS, and the nature of what people are going to do, and I think that's far more important, and it's at least things that, uh, I need to start using the term like prerequisites, because that's how I view a lot of NASCAR DFS stuff, you need to know a lot of things entering a race, you shouldn't be asking certain questions the day of, uh, asking to look things up the day of, like you should, this things. these are things you should be aware of, so first and foremost, the way that I'm going to do it, is I'm going to just build, you know, the projections for all the guys who make it into the race on, on Saturday, and I'm just going to run placeholders for the bottom three guys that we're waiting for for Sunday. This, in my opinion, I think this is what most people will do, but the reason why it gets a bit fishy is if you're using direct optimizers, and the reason being, so if I'm using the placeholder just where I'm at and stuff, like, I don't even know if I'm going to use the last three starters, depending on what happens, whatever the case may be, so I have a good idea of what my lines are. If you're using an optimizer to build lineups, you run into a situation where the time crunch is very small, even for people who aren't using optimizers but using their own personal simulations, which I know people who do that as well. Typically, when you're running that stuff, it takes anywhere from like 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes for your stuff to run the way you want it to. And that's usually the initial run to just figure out where things are. It's not rerunning stuff, changing projections, seeing where ownership is going to be, finding good pivots, finding, you know, different situations where this and that will work and stuff like that. We're at a really, really tight window. And that limits, in my opinion, a lot of what people are going to end up making. So we might end up seeing a situation to where, where did I mention it uh, earlier? Uh, let's see. I mentioned this earlier if I could find it here. Um, I mentioned it in, in the Discord. Uh, let's see. So some of the things that I'm looking at is that we're probably going to have overlay just by the nature of this because a lot of people are going to be like, well, we need the finalized starting grid. We can't mail lineups until the grid is done and stuff like that. Well, yet again, we have about a 40-minute hold. The contest should be at like 18,000, 19,000 people filled by the time that the... Um, it might even be higher. How many people are in this contest? So it's 23,000. Yeah, I think around like 17, 18,000 by the time the LCQ starts will probably be where it's at. We might not end up filling the full 23,000 uh, people. Secondly, I'm assuming that lineups are going to be less optimized due to the short time frame. Um, as I just said, with personal sims and stuff taking a long time with <clears throat> a lot of other places kind of just running one or two runs and stuff and be like, well, that's what we're running with for projections. That's what we're running with for ownership projections. It's not, you know, the whole, you know, 10, 12, whatever hour. When do we typically have? Even for smaller series, the Xfinity series and truck series, we typically have an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half, three hours, somewhere around there to build lines, run different things, see different builds and stuff come through. A lot of this stuff is going to be on a very, very tight time time crunch. And so I'm sure there's going to be situations and lineups that fall through the cracks. I'm assuming that we're going to have lineups just dead on arrival, and I'm assuming that the chalk plays might be a bit higher due to most places only having the time frame to run the one or two runs and simulations or whatever they're going to do. Like, I look, I understand that these, a lot of places run 10,000. A lot of these races are sim 10,000 times. We simulate every lap. and Yeah, but like, look, man, in a 30-minute time frame, like, you can only get so well in, in certain situations. And on top of that, and people knowing that, on top of that, or people being people doing that, and then on top of people already having favorites and stuff necessarily entering this week, I feel like we're going to have a situation to where um, as I said, I think we're going to have more chalkier lineups 
And we just need to be aware of that. And I think there's a lot of situations here where we can't take advantage of it. Now, I like using the term stupid for like this event is just stupid. <laughs> it's just dumb. Don't dump a lot of money into it. Like I'll probably do five lines, five on the 10, four, one, whatever. That's like 80 bucks, 100 bucks on this race. That's that, that that's what I view as a dumb, <laughs> stupid event, like throwing 100 bucks on it or whatever. Um this stuff is typically good for DFS because people just don't know how to fucking approach it. it. It's very similar like match play in PGA to where like if people aren't building the brackets and stuff, which people have done more and more recently. But like people just didn't do that. And so like op you would build optimally to like try and get your golfers in like top 16, 12, 8, whatever the ca case may be. That's the same situation here that people probably aren't going to do. And l let me bring this up in, in different terms. And so when we look at this race here, and I was curious because I was looking like clearly at the uh, at the at the salaries for this race here and in my head I was like well hmm you know we're gonna take 23 guys in this race so it'll be right here so we're losing this amount here or we're gonna lose these these numbers like it doesn't matter who it is whatever the case may be and then I was looking at salaries and I was like man when we looked at past optimal lineups we typically leave you know anywhere from like four to five thousand dollars I believe and I was looking at this, and I was like, well, they've actually priced a lot of people up. Like, just looking at this from an, from an entry or from an interest level and stuff. Kind of going back to what I mentioned here. Uh, I think that's both. So I was like, I was going to make, you know, drivers that I expect carrying interest or just notes and stuff. And then I was like, or as I was looking through that stuff, I was like, well, RFK, if people are looking at independent races last year on the short tracks, well, then RFK will probably be popular despite the fact they've never made this event. Because no the drivers have have made the main here at LA, at LA, and so I was like, well, depending on what people are pulling from, if they're pulling directly from the clash, that wouldn't necessarily bring people to RFK and stuff. But if they're pulling from races last year, that would probably bring them up. And so my initial thing was like, well, damn, if if any of the RFK guys would go, as I said, we're probably going to see, or this was me, like where I want to build. But for the most part, we're going over a lot here. So. My initial interest is anywhere is people from first to fourth, right? And then ninth to 16th. That is primarily where I want to focus on building lineups, okay? And the reason why I'm thinking about this regards to RFK is because we most likely need a random play or a place differential play to come through. When we're looking primarily at one through four, I believe that it's green here. And we look at nine through 16th and see where they finish. We have I got to find nine. Let's find nine. So we have nine, 10, 11. We're looking for 12, 13, 14. Where's 15 at? Am I missing 15 somewhere? 15, 15. We'll find it eventually. 15, 15, 16. So these are the, I'm going to highlight these guys. Same thing here. So we're top four. And then where are we at? Nine. Oh, We'll find nine in a second. Good Lord. We got nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, I believe 16 is up here. Yeah. So if we're primarily focusing on these starting positions, we've already gone, we've already, I've already talked about why that is. Why would we focus on these positions? We have a good chance of landing on at least some of the guys who are going to be scoring over 38 points, which is primarily what I'm focusing on in entering this race, okay? When I was when I was looking at like random or like different plays to get different, because we're probably gonna have a chalk play come through, most likely the pull, most likely the guy starting second, just based on this type of stuff. People will probably jump on the guy starting second. People are gonna be jumping on the guy starting first. We're gonna have uh, a good portion of like the guy starting tenth, uh, you know, people starting. Uh, 11th coming through whatever the case may be where we can kind of identify where the chalk is going to come through so when i was uh i gotta make sure because i'm in charge of the youtube stuff and make sure the live show is working okay um when we're looking at this type when we're looking at these types of builds and i was looking at well in order to get different because it's like twenty three thousand people 23 car field you got to try and get different here i was like what are like one-off plays just entering this week that i don't know if it's, is going to carry a lot of ownership and stuff and I brought up RFK for all the reasons that I said. And then I was like, well, what are their pricings at? And when I was looking at the pricing for these races here, I was like, man, that's a lot of 10K guys. Man, that's a lot of guys way up here 
above 9. We have 8 guys above 9K. Actually, 9 guys above 9K here. It wasn't that tight in years past. I don't have the full CSV for 2020. When is this one? This is 2022. I don't have it fully for... Was this last year? When was this? Wait, here, let's start over because I don't even remember where. I don't even remember which one is what. So let's go to let's go to old old sheets. We'll pull up last year. So this is 23. We'll pull up 20 seconds. So this is 22. So 22, I don't have. No, 22, I do have the full one. And when we look at the first year of the clash here, salaries are much softer. In anticipation for not knowing who's going to get through, whatever the case may be. And this is a drastic difference. Now, I understand, you know, we're looking at past optimal lineups and stuff, and we're seeing that we're leaving like three to 4000 Like, we haven't had to use the full salary. Well, we haven't had so many favorites entering this race that are so expensive. We haven't had this many people in the, in the 9K range when we look at this one, when we look at the first one. When we look at last year's... I'm assuming this is last year's. I did again. I opened them up. Whatever the case may be. I don't have the full ones, but these are all the people who made the race. And we see that we don't have a lot of 10K guys in this event. We don't have a lot of 9K guys in this event. If you're bringing in 23, 20, actually this was 27. If you're bringing the 27 of the 40, 36 salary guys, you should have higher salaries here. The average salary in this event was, where are we at, where are we at, where are we at? Average was 72. Okay, when we look at the other year, now this is every year, or this is everyone, so it's clearly going to be lower, but the average for this one was 66. Okay, when you compare the average of 66 last year, or in that event, to the average that we're seeing this year, we are at 74,000 uh, or 7,400 on average. So we're already seeing a situation where we're probably going to have to be quite tight on salary, at least in, in tighter than normal, unless things just get really dumb and we lose Larson, Trex, Blaney, all these idiots, like they're just taken out. Because like everybody's going to want to play Lar everybody's going to want to play Larson, everybody's going to play Truex, like all the favorite guys are having carrying ownership. Byron has been very good, yada, 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 uh, so on and so forth. So when I went to look at RFK and be like, man, these guys would probably be good one-offs or whatever, and I was like, 82, 85, that's insane. So like, that's the first thing that I haven't heard anybody talking about, is that we're probably going to be a lot tighter on this event than normal. So just entering this event, entering whatever it is, like we have 23 cars, so we're, we're losing this amount of people. There's a good chance that a lot of them are coming from the 5 and 6K range, but it's not going to be all of them. We're still probably going to lose some people up here. And in that situation, the only guy that I would see drastically change in how ownership is distributed would be if Austin Dillon misses the race. Because if he doesn't miss the race and he and he makes it, well, we're seeing that Austin Dillon has been a top scorer in this event. And I can't, I can't see this, so I apologize. I'm clicking all over. So we're seeing Austin Dillon, who has been... Starting, you know, middle of the pack, who've, who's been optimal the last couple of years. Same thing with Kyle Busch. And we're looking at how where he's placed this year at $7,100. Well, then we can already assume and look that Austin Dillon will most likely be popular regardless of where he starts. Because if especially if we do end up losing a majority of this area. Well, guess what? Austin Dillon then become he like we just imagine we lose the 5K range. You know, well, then guess what, man? Our value plays are in the 6K or whatever. Like, we might have some one or two 5K guys come through, but then that makes Austin Dillon one of the cheaper guys in this event, and that'll lead Austin Dillon to probably be to probably being popular. So that was the first thing I looked at when I'm looking at how to approach Sunday. And I would, the reason why I'm looking at that is I'm trying to, in my head, predict where optimizers will build, where, where certain builds will come through. And looking at this, like Austin Dillon will probably be popular regardless of the situation. We're probably going to have Bubba Wallace be popular. We're probably going to have Ryan Priest be popular based on the bias of last year and how he did. But also the fact that, hey, he also brought a shit RFK car the first year and did well until he had brake issues and stuff like that. You know, and so yet again, I'm not trying to say it's it's easy to build projections or have an idea of where people are going to go. But you can have these ideas and like secondary and tertiary approaches. Like the primary is like, well, we want to play... Truex, and so people are going to want to play Truex regardless of how he does. Like, that's the first initial of, like, who's going to be popular? Which, like, this is including, um, this is not that one, it is this one. So, like, this is the the short tracks, last, like, eight short tracks, which includes Bristol Dirt. But, like, when you look at the past 
short tracks, which take Bristol out as well. Like people are going to be using Martinsville. They're going to be using Richmond data. That'll lean them towards certain guys. So that's like the primary stuff. Secondary and tertiary entries are like where I'm kind of at of like, okay, well, yeah, Dylan is going to be popular in optimizers and regardless of what, where he qualifies and stuff based on what he's done as of late, based on how, how, uh, Richard Childers have done, has done on short tracks and stuff like that. How do we get different? How do we build different? What do we do? This isn't necessarily being like fade the chalk or whatever, but it's being aware of what people are going to do and being aware of how optimizers are going to build. So I fully expect, like if I throw shit in Saber Sim in a crunch, which I'm going to do to see what they're going to build, it's probably going to be pretty balanced lineups, probably chasing multiple, probably two 10K, couple 9K guys, and then it's going to lead you towards the seven or even the lower value range if those people get into the field and so like that's the first aspect of how to approach it or the first aspect of how to look at it so yet again going back to when i'm looking here and we're looking at a similar we're looking at a race to where it's very similar to, to this to where we had 23 cars in the first year and how people or how people scored we're going to have quite a lot of people like just performing bad and we're probably going to be chasing, you're probably going to be trying to chase, at least like trying to nail six of the top 14 scores. If you can do that, then you're going to be doing well. We're seeing that we're having place differential come through, you know, with the 21, 19, and 22. This year, it was, actually, that was, okay, yeah, that was starting. Last year, when we look at place differential came through, hey, the guy who started 23rd, so basically the guy who started last in both these races, I understand we had 27, but even 27 moved up to, well, that was Cendric, he was bad. But A.J. Almendinger, who started 26, like, they're moving up as well. And so when we're looking at <clears throat> how we're probably going to end up building, you know, we're probably going to have two to three place differential plays in the back competing to be one of those top 12 scorers, okay? That's just how it's going to be. Whoever that is, it doesn't, that, that, who it is, the, that question doesn't matter. The question is, and being aware of, the place differential that'll potentially fight to come through that isn't in the 9 to 16 range because we're already chasing this range, okay? So when, we're building, when I'm building my lines and when I'm trying to build lines, specifically late in the event, this is why I want to have placeholders for 21st, 22nd, and 23rd because that's why earlier when I said, I don't think I'm going to play them. But I need to be at least be aware because they're going to fight. 23rd and 22nd specifically, in my opinion, will probably fight to be anywhere from like a, a 17th to 10th place score, which will probably be important, especially when we look at the people who will probably be trying to get into that race, which will probably be some of the lower value ranges, okay? That'll probably be, unless we just have a big guy like a Christopher Bell or whatever, you know, spin out and not make the race or whatever. Um, but it's most likely going to be at least two out of the three guys who make it in from the LCQ will probably be from like the $8,600 and below range. And it moves into, well, when we're building tighter lineups, that place differential will probably be better or look better in the Sims and the optimizers and yada, yada, yada. Like it, it's, it's being aware of all this stuff when we just enter, you know, true crunch time. So you don't have to think about this stuff. We, like I've been talking right now for like, 18 minutes. Well, if, we, if you were thinking about all this stuff in that 30, 40 minute crunch, you know, on, on Sunday, then I mean like that, that you're already setting yourself up for failure or frustration and stuff like that. Um, when I am looking at people who are probably going to build like drivers that I expect to carry an interest entering this weekend. Uh, as I said, it's probably going to be Truex. He's going to be biased coming in or like people are going to lean Truex. When we look at Logano, which is so weird that like people are all over, they're like goo goo gaga over Truex to where these two idiots did the same thing. Logano the first year was optimal, and then he, he, he did poor last year. And we have Truex who did great last year, who did poor the first year. Like, why, are, why is the same love not being held to Logano? I just don't understand that because people are like looking at weird, weird data points and stuff like that. But like Larson is going to carry ownership. We're going to have the Hendrick guys. We're going to have um, RCR guys. And it's most likely uh, that Hendrick, Joe Gibbs, and RCR will be the primary like focus points of guys leading laps and stuff like that. When we're looking at the actual practice laps and stuff, and the reason why I actually feel not conf not more confident, but why I'm not as, as nervous about where people are qualifying necessarily is because they're taking their fastest practice time in the final practice session now. I think that's just how NASCAR should do it in general over this stupid queue, this fucking different group shit, okay? Just take the fastest laps from fucking final practice. Who gives a shit? Um, you might be like, well, you know, 
some people do Q runs or whatever. Isn't that an issue? Well, yes and no. Like, yeah, like whenever you do a Q run like a normal practice, so it's still typically the faster guys who are competing for the pole or competing to be up front running Q laps and stuff or running a Q time or whatever. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that. Like nobody's entering this clash and be like, well, we got to run a Q. <laughs> like we got to do a Q run, a Q test. Like nobody's doing that. So like the fastest practice time should naturally come from the fastest guys. Like, you're not going to have, like, a one-off practice flying lap unless you just absolutely have a clean track in front of you, which is where those laps will come from. But, like, it's not going to be drastically different. Like, we're not going to see somebody, some bum who's, like, having, a you know, an average speed of, like, 23rd between all the cars on there just pop off and get the pole position. Like, we're, we're not going to see that. Even if he has clean range in front of him or a clean road in front of him, you're not going to see somebody just jump that way. And so I would trust the practice time in terms of, starting position like it's not going to be as fluky as that so like your lead guys in the heat races this year i would argue will probably have a better chance of being true lap leaders and maintain a position in the top uh DraftKings finishers last we've had two of each in we've had two out of four uh in the last races be top 13 scores and actually three if you count last year but like I think this would probably increase more because, like, Haley, yes, Haley was fast the first year, got moved out, wrecked by Larson, whatever the case may be. Reddick, you know, has mechanical failure. Like, easily three of these guys. Like, if you move Reddick up there, he's probably performing very similar to how these guys are. And then, like, Haley and Eric Amarola, who got here just based on their qualifying times and them doing well in their heat races, I don't think we're going to necessarily run into a situation where we have somebody like Haley or Gamarola or somebody who's lacking in speed be in the top four. So I'm more open to playing more of the guys in the top four. And then same thing with the guys from 19th to 6. If you're slow in practice, guess what? You're going to be starting bad in the heats. So, like, this is just, at least in my opinion, the way that they're setting the grid and the way they're doing everything this year, I, I would trust these positions more than I probably would have or probably did uh, entering this week. Uh, this is probably going to be my primary thing. And then, like, you know, being aware being aware of the PD starting in the rear. So, like, that is where my primary interests are going to come from. And I think I'm primarily going to project these plays, not on a bias, but, like, if you look here, that's where a majority of these plays are coming from outside of place differential. So if you focus on these and I can project them correctly, and I'm more aggressive on that than I have in previous years of, like, chasing place differential, which I don't even know um, where I'm at. Like, I don't even remember what I played. Like, previous years I've had to, like, look at the last 40 laps of people and, and do this shit and stuff like that. I'm not necessarily as concerned about that this year. Um, so, like, that's where I'm at. I haven't, I haven't talked a single driver I haven't talked anything. I haven't talked to be like, oh, this guy should carry interest. I'm not doing that. I don't like doing that. People know. Like, if you go through the entire fucking grid and you go through all this, you can make a case for everybody. I can be like, well, you know, Ty Gibbs, he's a young guy, but he's got, he's got Joe Gibbs. He, you know, he got wrecked last year, but he was making his way through the field. Like, that's, I don't, I don't like doing that. You know, I don't like doing that. I don't like making cases for everybody. It doesn't help anything. It doesn't do anything. This is where, and this is how I want to, Look at this and approach it and stuff like that. We'll talk about drivers and stuff in the live show once we have everything finalized. But, like, doing things early doesn't matter. Secondly, uh, I can't implore you people to not even notice drivers' names. Don't care about these people. They don't care about you. You don't care about them. They're, they, they are just numbers on a screen to us. We're here to make money. They don't matter. Your biases towards them don't matter. Like, I can't wait until we get in the year where I can just keep saying, like, is Bubba Wallace ever going to win a race? Because it's just funny. He, he, he tilts people, whatever. But, like, you shouldn't have any biases coming through. Um, and you should be very hesitant on liking certain people based on their short track history or based specifically on how they performed at Richmond or how they performed at Martinsville. I think that already forces you into a bubble that's very dangerous, okay? I think you should just be open and focus primarily on, especially in an event like this that is so stupid and independent of everything else because there's no other track that is, you're pulling anything from here. Like, people are talking about freaking Gateway. People are talking about New Hampshire. People are talking about, you can run the High Line at Richmond. Like, the, the, the middle lane at Richmond is, like, where you want to be. Like, what are you talking about? That's a fall off. You got tire wear there. Like, what are we talking about, y'all? 
This is a fresh, this is fresh asphalt on no banking or like one, two, whatever the degrees. It's flat. It's fucking flat. Who cares? Like, that's all it is, man. We've talked about, and I talked about last race, what positions have advantages on the restart, what positions are more advantageous than others, like, and stuff like that. Like, we we don't need to overthink this stuff. We don't need to just throw in more data. This is situations where I'm like, yeah, like, be aware of the data, be aware of everything, but don't, like, let that cloud your judgment and stuff. I don't know. At least that's where I'm at. And what I mean by data is everything related to last year's races, their running position, their practice data, last year's practice data at short tracks. Like, be aware of all that, but don't, why, why are we setting flags right now? It is Wednesday, my dudes. Wednesday at 11 a.m. Why are we setting flags on, on drivers that'll be popular? You know, I'm just doing that because I have to, I, I have to try and expect where ownership is going to come from regardless of where people are, which we can do that, which we can see that. But um, that's my clash preview. Like, that's where I'm at, man. I'll, I, I trust more of the, the qualifying for the heat races this year, probably more than last. I'm going to trust more of the practice sessions, specifically later in the day. And I'll look for certain things. And, and hopefully, I pray to God, Fox can give us some good camera footage, man. Because it'd be great if I could just see the whole... If I could just see how people do in traffic and practice, that'd be fantastic. Who's able to pass people? There's so much more than just average speed out there. Like, there's so many more things to go into it. Um, but yeah, any, anyway, so that's like my 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 clash preview. We didn't talk about any cert, any specific driver. We're talking more about this from a game theory, from what a lot of the public is going to do, from things that are going to run into and questions that people are going to run into, you know, in between that short 40 to 30 minute crunch time and if you're aware of that stuff and if you're paying attention far before you get there, well then you can take advantage of it, you know? Um and that that's really it. I think we're going to see Chalk plays, especially once we have projections, really center around popular plays. If they're projecting well, specifically probably place differential plays and probably early lap leaders in the top. Like, I would, I, I can imagine that we can easily project who's going to be the highest owned of the top four scorers or, or of the top four starters. We can probably easily project who's first, who's highest, who's second, who's third, who's fourth, who's, who's highest owned there. Who's probably the highest owned value once we get that done? By that point, you have five, around five ownerships. You look at place differential, that is probably going to carry ownership. You have six, seven. That's seven drivers that you can realistically have an idea of what their ownership is going to be. Not necessarily, this guy's going to be 42.5% owned, but like where they're going to fall in terms of ownership. Like that's, that, that, that's where you need to be. That's where you need to be thinking of. Because then you can play or you can use like three, four, even five of those and then run a a realistic one-off or a pivot or try and build different with those ownerships. Like that's where the salary comes in. I think we're playing with tighter salary than normal in the last two years. These are all things we need to consider and be aware of and stuff. And this is all the things that I think of entering a week, entering situations. These are things that I don't hear anybody else talking about. It's probably too boring for them, but that's where I'm at. And uh, yeah, I hope this helps you kind of have the mentality or have the uh, have at least be aware of this. This is a prerequisite before we get to heat races, before we get to practice, before we get to the premium live show. We get before we get to the live show Sunday morning. You should be aware of all this stuff. You should be aware of everything I mentioned in the last LA Clash video. And uh, that's just how I don't know. That's how I would. That's how I approach it. That's how I look at things. That's how I view things. And uh, I'm looking forward to this race and trying to see what the public is going to do and where everybody goes and stuff like that. So I will see you guys. Premium show. Saturday evening, live show, Sunday morning, and uh, yeah, thanks for just supporting me and watching my stuff, and I'll see you guys later.